Um, yes. Um, so as I'm David Houghton, I'm chair of an organization called the Selborne Society. Um, although it's called the Selborne Society and Selborne's in Hampshire, um, it's called that because it was named in honor of Gilbert White, who was one of the first naturalists who was based in Selborne. And now we run a nature reserve in Northwest London. And we'll talk a little bit about recording moths, butterflies, some of the data issues and try and reflect on some of the things that we've, we've talked about, which we've gone through today as well. Um, so that's a quick run through of it, what we're going to talk about. Um, and just to give an idea of where we are, I don't know how well people can see this map, but the little arrow points to Perryville Wood, it's in the London Borough of Ealing, just. Um, we are down here in South Kensington. This is, this is an area of London. You can sort of see the, the Thames, which will hopefully be a, give people a bit of a sense of where it is. It's a fairly small area. We'll talk about the size a bit later. Um, and it's a bit of ancient woodland. We heard about the definition of ancient woodland earlier. Um, it definitely meets that definition. Um, we had someone talk about archaeological evidence for ancient woodland. Um, and we've got our archaeologists having a look at the curve and thinking about it. And we think at the moment we can date it back to being a medieval plantation possibly a Norman plantation sometime. It seems to be, it seems to be records of it from about the 12th century. Uh, so that gives us some sense of where the reserve is, when it is, what it's like. That's going to be a very little relevance to anyone else other than me, but that's a map of the reserve. Um, just give a sense of it. It's reasonably close to a square in shape, which I do find makes things a bit easier. Um, and what does it consist of? Well, I'll just very quickly run through this. So we've got some pastures around the outside. Um, these are approximately five acres of pasture land. Um, and they are essentially around the edge of the reserve. The, the areas, um, these are maintained, or have been until recently maintained by grazing by horses. We had a neighbor who had some horses, she put her horses in. They grazed it, they stopped scrub encroachment. Um, we lost that, we maintained it a bit by mechanical cutting and removing the varieties for a few years. And then the last couple of years, we've had a small herd of cattle in doing the looking after the pastures for us. Um, the bulk of the reserve, as the name Perryville Wood might suggest, is woodland, and that's around 18 acres. Um, let me move on. There we go, woodland. Um, this is this is a, a nice, I'd I, I like to think that Moya came and painted our woodland for us, but this is actually a photo I took that just what the camera just wobbled. And I thought it looked rather nicer than any picture I've taken in the bluebells that are in focus. Um, but we've got the woodland, it's famous for the big displays of bluebells. And we have a we have one day here when we're open to the general public to come and see the bluebells. Um, and we have on occasions in the past when it wasn't COVID and we would let people in, had over 2,000 people come on the one day to wander around our fairly small woodland and look at the bluebells. Um, but it's ancient woodland, ancient oak woodland, predominantly with a hazel understory and lots of other plants. And of course, the woodland has a canopy layer. I'll briefly mention that a bit later. Um, and you can see some of the things that go on with, with bits of ancient woodland here, where there's the odd tree that's just died in the middle and opens up life. And underneath, as I said, that's hazel underneath the, the thing. And then the layer below that is dominated by bramble, bluebell, and a few other plants. And around the edges of the woodland, and this is again, this is a really important ecological thing, is edge habitat can be really important. Habitat that's between ancient woodland and unimproved pasture land ends up being really good for species that just have this weird habit of wanting both their habitats and needing both of them at the same time. And the edges are a bit different in structure. They've got quite a lot of English elm. Uh, and they've got quite a lot of willow and elder and blackthorn and some rather old hedges. And um, we haven't been able to trace back the ages of our hedges properly, but our, our archaeologists suggest they're old woodbank features and they're probably pretty old as well. Um, and certainly the site next door, Hordenden Hill, has some hedges that we can trace back certainly several hundreds of years on the same route. So it all suggests we've got, you know. And then probably the least important or the least significant habitat for this site is the aquatic habitats. Fairly limited in nature, a couple of acres in size, a few ponds on a 
broad definition of the word pond there. Some of them spend a lot of their time dry, but about four, four or five ponds, a couple of wet ditches, two runnels. Don't have to be the difference between a runnel and a wet ditch, but somebody knows. Um, and these all provide a different habitat and a lot of common reed, um, which we'll, we'll talk about as well. Um, and then there's sort of just general miscellaneous weird stuff. The edge of the reserve is this odd habitat that in Victorian times, we were the energy economy of London. They used to come up here, they used to fill the barge with this food for the horses, and they used to take that back to London and they'd feed their horses. And then that's an empty barge. You don't want an empty barge, it's a waste of time. So you filled that with rubbish from London, you came up here and you took that aside. So it's all old, old Victorian rubbish dump. Put that in perspective, that probably built up over 20 years. It's about the amount of rubbish London produces in a week today. So we'd be nasty about the Victorians dumping their rubbish on us, but uh, we're not much better. And I'll briefly talk about why is that working? Is that displaying anything? Okay, there was a picture here. That's very annoying. Okay, I was going to show you a picture showing the building with records, but it seems to have disappeared. That's rather irritating. It was here this morning. That's because I've opened this in PowerPoint. It was close to something else. Okay. So we started recording, and it wasn't me, I'm not that old, but recording in the reserve was started in the 1960s for Lepidoptera. Um, it was recorded by someone who's already had a mention this, this, in this talk, which is a gentleman called Peter Edwards. And Peter, when he was a, a very young man, started recording our butterflies for us. And the records have sort of built up over time, over an intensive period of recording that Peter did, a bit of calmer, quiet and recording with some we're going through then. And then a more recent survey that I started doing with some friends of mine in the mid 2000s. And the number of records we've got now have built up where on, um, on the I have to look it up now because it's not on the graph and I can't read it on the graph, so I'm going to have to look it up in the, in the book I've got in front of me. Apologies for that. Um, let me see if I can find this. Sorry, this is the problem with presentations. So, yes, well, by the end of 2015, when I last put all the records together in a musical form, we had about 620 odd species recorded. Um, and the real effort made to record them. One of the main things we do is light trapping. Um, we use a series, variety of different trap designs with a bright light on top. The moths come to the light, they drop into a box. I get up at dawn. It's really painful in summer. But I get up at dawn, go through the trap, see what's there. And we have experimented with some LED traps similar to the ones that were shown in the last talk. Um, and they can be quite interesting. Actually, in, in winter, when not only the geographic under recording, we're talking about the side project, but the, the temporal under recording, a lot of moth recorders go into hibernation over winter. And the LED traps work a little, seem to work pretty effectively in winter. So that would be another area that, that's worth thinking about when you think about your, your recording effort, is recording throughout the year because there are more supply in, in the, the winter time. Um, and when I was pulling together a summary, and we, we've got a, a book that we've published that summarizes the moth fauna in probably more detail than anybody but me would want to read. It goes to every species and talk about where they are. Um, this drew in a lot of the data held by the Selborne Society itself, but I wanted to know about the site next door and the area around it. So that's where I reached out to our friend from Giggle, who talked earlier about their data service, and <clears throat> was able to get in from them a lot of data we didn't know about other people who visited that site and recorded around us. And that helped me put in context what I'm doing. Uh, so I talked a little bit about how we go about recording. I say the main method is light trapping. And again, this is another interesting challenge because some species don't come to light as effectively as others. Some do. And again, this introduces interesting data biases, interesting methodological biases. Um, so I have tried to do some of the older methods. I've tried to do sugaring, where you get some beer, and you get some sugar, and you get some treacle, and you boil it all up, and you mix it all up, and you smear it on trees, and it comes to attract the moths to that and you can have a look. And if you do it right, you don't quite use all of the to make that, you can drink some of it. Oh, lovely. And we've done that. Um, some other methods that we've talked about, this is 
what's going on now? Again, this would be a, this would be a lovely chart of data on here, but there isn't. Um, somebody mentioned before, butterfly transects are a method we've used for survey. And these are a very formal data survey method. They are very systematized, very standardized. You walk a fixed route at least once a week from April till the end of September. You record all the butterflies you see within two and a half meters that way, two and a half meters that way, two and a half meters that way, two and a half meters that way. You don't record any of them, record them, but you don't go into the formal data. So you don't record any of the other butterflies. And you do that, you walk a fixed route, you repeat it. And what that means is you've got fairly robust data. I can say that last year I saw more than this year. That might mean something's gone down. And over time, that contributes to all sorts of national schemes and tells us something. And that allowed me, which if I had the chart here, you'd be able to see the ones I pulled out, to look at whether we'd see any significant changes in you know, using significant there in the statistically robust sense of the word. And we can see that some species, marbled white, which again was featured in one of the earlier presentations, has significantly grown on the site, become much more common. Um, we've not particularly seen any that have shown a decline, I think, in what I've, I've found, which is encouraging uh, in my site management. And another new method. Um, we did this really as a, a proof of concept, um, but this was using a drone to look for some of the butterflies that live in the canopy. Um, again, we saw one of those butterflies earlier today. Somebody showed us a picture of a white leather hair streak. It's an elm associated species that lives up in the canopies. And they're quite difficult to see because your eyes aren't in the canopy. So we thought, well, why don't we do a bit of an experiment here? See it, we fly a drone up there, we can watch through a drone and do a butterfly count. And the short version of what we found is. It would prob it'll probably give you present absence of at least larger species down to that sort of hair streak butterfly size. You probably wouldn't be able to one of the smaller things, and you probably couldn't do a systematic transect type of survey because you've really got to just sit the drone still and watch what's flying. If you try and move the drone, there's too much disturbance. But for sites where you can't easily get in to do to scan with binoculars from the ground, we, we thought this. With a new concept might might well tell us something. So I thought I'd mention that. It's uh, not really added any knowledge to our site, but it was a good experiment to do. And yeah, summary of what we've seen. Oh, that one displayed. That one's actually displayed. Excellent. That's the summary of the species we've got. And as you can see, there's a variety of species with different status. Um, I've interpreted the statuses there because they don't always mean what you think they mean. Um, but these words have special meanings in, in biological recording. And as you can see, as you'd expect, most of the species are common. It's a, a line from, from Bill Oddy. You can, you can prove statistically that common species are seen more commonly than rare species. Um, but some, quite, some stuff that's quite scarce there as well, some stuff that's recently arrived. Um, and I'll just briefly mention a few of the things that we've got. A couple of things that showed up there as red data species, the status that means that these are perhaps particularly endangered, particularly threatened species. And the two I've got here are the toad flax facade and the small ranunculus. Um, I swear these are both red data in the latest assessment. They're both viewed as extremely rare and potentially threatened. They're probably not. Um, toad flax decade seems to be really spreading and expanding. It seems to have learned to use toad flax as people plant in their gardens. And I suspect it will not be red data next time we reevaluate. Small ranunculus is one of those really strange species that seems to colonize Britain, then go extinct, then colonize Britain, then go extinct, and so on. And it's just during one of its col colonizing phases. Um, there are a couple of national scarcities there. Um, the two I've worked for, the two I've shown here, um, this to be in a Stephen CI, but these don't have vernacular names for those who like such things. And it's been recorded two or three times. Um, An Asaria inoxiella recorded once, and there's a few other records from the area. And these are both reasonably scarce species. But again, this is probably going to things about data. These micro moths 
these smaller moths, the scale here are millimeters, to give you a sense of what size we're looking at here, tend to be under recorded because they're harder to do. And we've really relied on the help of a friend of mine called Rachel Terry, who helps me with a lot of the difficult micros. I have some ability to do them myself, but I, I really rely on her. And we've had a few other of those national scarcities, a few more pretty national scarcities. So I'll do from top left is Ectodemia decentella, top right is the Pisaria sordidatella. These are hard. The next one, bottom left, actually got a, got a vernacular name. It's the hollyhock seed moth or Pexicopia malvella. And the bottom right is Pymena, Pymena gigantiana. Um, and just this year, I bought a synthetic pheromone lure, a synthetic chemical that smells like, smells like female moths. So you hang up and the, the male moths smell it and then come find the females and then get disappointed to find a lump of plastic. Um, so I'm going to, I've done another survey for that species using that lure this year. I didn't succeed in finding any, but we'll give it another go. And some more national scarcities. Um, Allegia similella is one of the species viewed as telling you it's ancient woodland. If you don't know it's ancient woodland from maps and from history, there's a variety of things you can do. One of them is you can look at the animals associated with it. And this is a species that tends to be thought of as an ancient woodland indicator. So it was nice to get that to confirm what we thought about our site. We have button snout, feeds on hops. Um, and it's perhaps not quite as scarce as it was once thought, but it's still a reasonably uncommon moth. Jersey tiger is not scarce at all now. If you live in London, you've seen this, this, this moth. It's huge, it's attractive, it's visually obvious, it's massively well recorded, but people see it and go, what on earth was that? And tell someone about it. Um, but when I started recording, this would have been an incredible thing. And that shows again some of the value of data and that sort of citizen science engagement. And we can track the spread of that moth from South London originally really quickly to a large part of, of the South of England now. And dotted chestnut on the right, which is again another one a bit associated with ancient woodland. And it lets us spot new arrivals, species that have turned up for the first time. And I'll mention these four, because again, these again have been reasonably well tracked in some of the, some of the data that's gathered by moth recorders. Top left is tree like and leafy. So when I first found one of these, I read my book and it said there'd been seven, like seven records from the United Kingdom in the past 150 years. So I decided I was wrong. I obviously hadn't found that. But this is a species that's colonizing um, and is spreading in them. And it's probably spreading because of the result of environmental change, because of the result of action taken to deal with environmental problems. It's just a good thing to have in mind with COP26 going on up there in Glasgow. This was probably spreading because we took action to deal with the really strong amounts of pollution from coal burning and domestic heating. It's a sort of a pollution killing off the light into the feed back. So you can make a difference and you can see the difference in the, in the data we gather. Top right is an invasive species. This is a box moth. Um, if you've got a box hedge in your garden, you might not have in London anymore. It might have been eaten by little caterpillars. That's the rather attractive adult of those little caterpillars. This is the dark form, it has three forms. And it has, there are three color forms to it, the dark one, a light one, and a sort of big intermediate one. And again, there's a lovely citizen science project asking us to record the different forms as we see what we can learn about that. Um, the bottom left is a moth that lives inside a leaf. Its caterpillar lives in between the top and the bottom of the leaf. It's really flat. Philonictus xenia. It's a recent colonist in the UK living on poplars. And the bottom right is a species called Praes peregrina. It's rather an odd species, this one. We don't know much about it. We know more about it now than we did. Um, but this was discovered new to science in. Uh, I think about 2000, no, exactly right, 2005, just up the road from Perivale Wood. When I say just up the road from Perivale Wood, I mean in my back garden. Um, so I pulled this moth out, it eventually went around the things, and we proved to be a species nobody had ever recorded in the scientific literature before. It's in a drawer somewhere in this building now, because that's where things go. But there are scatterings of this record all around London, all around London. we still don't really know how it got here. 
where it got here. They have now discovered what it's feeding on, which is Zuta, Zoos, plants in that genus. Um, but it doesn't seem likely it's a British species, given the amount of recording we do. It's just been here all these years and we've just never noticed. So it must have come from somewhere else in the world, but I don't think it's yet been found in any other country in the world. It's a really odd, really interesting species. And again, having people out there as we do in Britain, having this culture of amateur recording, gathering and sharing data, is probably why we've detected this before lots of other people. So that's a very quick gallop through, hopefully a few references on, on data gathering, a few thoughts about where we share, where we link into the sort of stuff we've been hearing about today. And just a few acknowledgements at the end of this, thanks to the Selborne Society, which I'm involved in running, but which has allowed me and others to record there for many years. Thanks particularly to Rachel Terry and County Moth Recorder Colin Plant for a lot of help with ID problems. I wouldn't know nearly as much about their help. And then a whole list of people there, some of the main people who've been involved in doing the recording with me, before me. Um, there. And just to thank them. And that is probably enough for me. I will leave it there and wander on. Thank you.